them as we can. Yeah, they would love nothing more than Donna that. Fermato on November the 19th of 2010 concerning information as to uh, Andrea Snyderman having been told her husband had been shot at Dunwoody Prep. Um, we have, there is a record in the file which we were provided by the district attorney's office of an interview that Mark Potter had conducted with Ms. Formato back in May of 2011, at which point she said that she was present when uh, Sergeant Cordellino told uh, Andrea, Andrea Snyderman that her husband had been shot. Okay. We also have reason to believe, based on my interview of Ms. Stansbury, that she was present uh, when Ms. Formato, on the day after the shooting, basically related information concerning that Andrea Snyderman was made aware of the fact that her husband had been shot and her physical reaction as such. Yeah. She is now on the witness end. You have seen Ms. Formato. She basically said she did not recall ever making those statements. Mr. Morgan attempted to direct her attention to those particular times, basically specifically asked her about those particular times, the 19th of November of 2010, and I believe May 31st of 2011, and sought to ask her specifically whether or not she had made those statements. There was an objection from the state as to those being leading questions. As such, by the court's ruling, he was not allowed to go into the fact that, uh, or even elicit from her an answer as to whether or not she had ever made those particular statements or had any recollection of them. Now, we will concede, typically a witness has to be confronted with a previous statement before another inconsistent statement can be allowed into evidence. But in this case, the state's objection and the court's ruling effectively prevented Mr. Morgan from doing so. He specifically sought and tried to do so as to each of these particular conversations. As such, we now are attempting to get into the statements that Ms. Formato made, at least at this point, to Elizabeth Stansbury, and the court is saying, we haven't laid a proper foundation. But when Mr. Morgan, in fact, sought to lay that foundation, this court sustained the objection of the district attorney's office on the grounds that it was a leading question. So we have effectively been precluded from laying the proper foundation, and now, having been precluded from doing that, even though we, in fact, sought to do that, are being prevented from cross-examining or producing evidence from this witness, which is inconsistent with what Ms. Fermato said on the witness stand. Mr. Petrie also let me, let me ask you something, Ms. Clay. I, Certainly. You, you make a reference in, in this presentation about the Potter report and something that may be, I'm sorry, it was provided to you. Yes. And was, and correct me if I'm wrong, at what point was Ms. well, I'm going to say Donna, presented by Mr. Morgan with that report to either refresh your recollection or the view. I understand the objection on, and I did sustain that, but at what point uh, was she approached or was that report given to her to refresh her recollection on whether or not she even had that conversation with Investigator Potter? She was on the witness stand. Mr. Morgan did not specifically approach her with the document, but directed her attention to that specific day and sought to direct her attention to that specific uh, discussion. I don't know of any rule that requires the uh, party seeking to impeach a statement to uh, use a piece of paper as opposed to directing the attention of the witness in open court. I do not believe there is any well, I, distinction I, I, or, or I, difference in that regard. I'm not disagreeing with you on that report. The point was, as far as uh, we, we may disagree on the, the summation of what you're giving, but I'm going to let you finish. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Mr. Petrie also looked up a case from the United States versus, and I have no idea how to pronounce this, B-I-L-L-U-E, at 994 F. Second from the 11th Circuit, 1993, and it is a summary from a treatise, I believe, that it basically says, if a witness says he does not remember a statement, the statement may be proven by another witness. Okay. So I certainly think we can do that. I mean, the bottom line is we have attempted to go ahead and elicit from Ms. Formato the fact that direct her attention to these specific statements. We have sought to lay the foundation the objection of the DA and the court's ruling have prevented us from laying the foundation. Now you're telling us we can't get in this statement through this witness as to what Ms. Formato said because we haven't laid a proper foundation. Well, How can we do that if the court won't allow us the opportunity to in fact do so? 
Yes, Mr. Clegg, I understand what you just said, and I will definitely pull that case that you are citing now, and I'll have my staff there to pull it. Sure. And, and I have no problem taking a look at, look at that particular case. Okay. Uh, it's 994 F. Second. Uh, what is the um, page number, John? Second. All right, thank you. Ms. Jeffers, would you pull that while I'm listening to the state's response? And, you know, and Mr. Clegg has one more thing he wants to tell the court, I believe. Oh, th that's I'm not sure that I Oh, we're back on the record, Ms. I now, <laughs> I now remember the other point I was wishing to make. Um, you don't have to confront the, you don't have to make an attempt to refresh the witness's memory in order to direct their attention specifically to what they have previously said. You are asking whether an attempt was made to refresh her memory. There was not, but that is not a condition precedent to an attempt to directing the witness's attention to a previous inconsistent statement asking whether or not that previous inconsistent statement was made, and if they claim to forget, allowing us to prove it by other means. I, I agree with what you're saying right now. Yes, I agree with that. Okay. We have the state's response. Who's Mr. James? Yes, sir. Um, it seems to me to be pretty clear, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Morgan was up here. He had Ms. Formato um, on direct examination, and he was attempting, and I'll stress attempting to lay a foundation. Um, for a prior inconsistent statement. The problem is that Mr. Morgan didn't do it properly. Um, I don't disagree with counsel, um, um, either counsel in their assessment of the case law about someone stating that they do not recall. However, the problem is, um, is that the reason they were limited um, in terms of showing her that statement or bringing out what the uh, potential statement that they wanted to confront her with is because they weren't doing so properly. Um, our objection was leading because he was leading the witness and it was his witness. So the way not to lead her and to confront her with the statement is to give her the statement and ask her if it refreshes her recollection. Um, that is within the four corners of the rules of evidence. Um, even when one is attempting to lay a foundation for impeachment or bring someone's attention to a particular statement, they still, so, they still have to comply with the rules of evidence. And so the problem here um, is that the plane never got off the ground. Mr. Morgan never got past the first step, which was um, laying a proper foundation. Um, it's not that his assessment of the raw law on the back end isn't correct. Um, he has the ability, if he, I, I know she's been released, but if they can find her and resubpoena her, he can call her, put her back on the stand, um, and lay the proper foundation, but he's not done so. Ms. Clegg, anything else to write? No, sir, nothing further. All right, lawyers. Uh, what I'm going to do, uh, Ms. Jeffries is pulling that most recent case that was cited, and I have no problem taking a look at that. Uh, but I can tell you, I, definitely, I concur with uh, Mr. DA's uh, assessment on what took place, at least what I heard. Uh, but let me take a look at this case. Jeff Hutland, you're back with Jay Strongwater. Jay, what's going on right now? I've missed the question that's caused uh, the judge to take a break in the testimony. My understanding is that there was a question raised and the state has an objection. And rather than just a speaking objection of saying this is why we think it should not come in, they're supporting their objection with some type of uh, case citation, which is pretty unusual for a mid trial uh, question and answer. Uh, most of these questions would have already been anticipated by the, by the state. And, but they, and I say that at the same time they seem to have anticipated it because they have a case ready to throw up to the judge. Are, are there more issues between the prosecution 
and the defense now that maybe we have not seen over the last few days where there are more small points of contention between the two sides? It's really a question of style. Uh -huh. I was asked by a judge once why you object so much, and I said my job is to make it as difficult as possible for you to make a clean record. <laughs> and the judge would look at the, at the prosecutor and say your job is to protect me as well as try your case, because no one wants to try this twice. So if the defense raises a question, you need to come up with a good answer for me and avoid having me make hard choices. Judge Adams has been interesting to watch through this. The courtroom is his biome, clearly. He yes. is in charge of all things, has a good keen sense of humor and, and keeps things moving right on time, stands up seemingly when he needs to. Uh, a, a judge really is sort of like a point guard basketball. He, he really kind of sets the tempo for the style and the speed of the game. Exactly. And you had asked um, other attorneys that have shared their opinions with you, by being on time gets everybody on time. There's no delay. People are getting used to him being, saying five minute break and taking a 10 minute break. People straggle in a little later. The jurors start to tr not to trust the break time and every everything seems to slow down because people are taking liberties. Uh, the, the nice thing about elected judges is that they have to get out in the public. Should judges be elected? It seems like the last thing that you know, voters should decide when we can't even figure out our own renewal for our license plates and our driver's licenses. In the days of nonpartisanship, it was a good, healthy idea. Today, that with elections where one side will find one case in a hundred that uh, irritates a particular voting block, it then it becomes skewed. It, it seems like the election of district attorneys also is an antiquated idea. Agree or disagree with my premise? I like the elected executives. I like a nonpartisan, merit-based judiciary. Mm -hmm. Now, also explain, and this is a question that we have had oft repeated um, over the last couple of weeks, and that is why Judge Adams is presiding over this case as he did with Hemi Newman. Well, he was randomly assigned the Hemi Newman case. Having sat through all the pretrial motions and made rulings, having heard both testimony in court plus things that are said in chambers, it would be inefficient to suddenly assign it to another judge who would start the whole process again. All right, let's, uh, let's go back into the courtroom. Well, before we sign it off, I think we better, we better hang on here, Jay Strongwater, okay. as the attorneys step up. It's interesting, and this is unscientific, but you know, we live in an era of social media where Twitter and Facebook and all kinds of, of uh, uh, reaction means something. And, and just what exactly it means, I think none of us are quite sure. But I've, I've kind of kept an eye on message boards and things like that to sort of see how people are reacting to certain witnesses. And the witness, Tammy Parker, the attorney, real estate attorney, friend of Andrea Snyderman, has elicited a strong response, and, and not all of it positive, on Twitter. Your thoughts on that? She seemed matter of fact. Was it her style? Was it her smoothness? She certainly was playing to the jury and to the judge at various times. That seems to be an element that has rankled some on social media this afternoon. The comments by the folks right, that are, we'll back on the I'll tell you what, we'll come back to that. We will remember uh, that, uh, uh, that, that point and we'll talk about it. Back to Judge Adams. By the defense, United States versus I mean, like Billy, B I L L U E. Uh, and it makes reference to the law is clear that if a witness has denied making a statement or has failed to remember it, although no statement was provided by the previous witness, the making of the statement may be proved by another witness. Although it was not propounded to the previous witness, but for the sake of moving this case forward, I'm going to allow Mr. Clay to ask her that question about what she may or may not have said earlier, what, what the previous witness may or may not have said uh, to a different individual for the purpose of quote unquote impeachment, although that witness was not confronted with any statement he's in this courtroom. What we're going to do is bring in the witness, Mr. Clay, if you could bring her back in, Ms. Um, Salisbury, or Sansbury, and then uh, Deputy Garrett, let's go ahead and bring in the jury at the same time. And Mr. Clegg, she's with you. Yes, sir. An exception is noted from the state.
Come on, come on up, Miss Sandsbury. Let's have a seat. You will be coming back in momentarily. Thank you for your patience. Yeah, yeah, come on up, Lloyd. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Come on up, Lloyd. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your patience, and thank you. And it was brought my attention. It's warm in here, and we will uh, get uh, the maintenance people to do something about the air conditioning, but for right now, it's just warm. So I understand, and I understand. All right, Mr. Clegg, she's with me. Okay. <coughs> Ms. Stansbury, um, before the recess, I had asked you a question uh, concerning uh, a conversation that you had had with Donna Formato on the 19th of November at Dunwoody Prep. Did you in fact have such a conversation, ma'am? Yes, I did. Would you relate to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury at this time what it is that Donna Fermato told you at that time, ma'am? Sure. Um, I decided to go over there before heading over to Andrews to drop food because I had been involved with the teachers at Dunwoody Prep pretty intimately for the two years prior. And so going over there was truly just to give support to the administrators and the teachers. Uh, as soon as I arrived at the door, Donna opened and she just started bawling. Um, was very upset. Uh, and she took me back into her little office, which is no more like uh, maybe a four by or a five by five office. And uh, she just started relaying things that happened the day before. Um, she talked about how when it first happened, um, the shooting happened. Um, the police told her to call Andrea, but not to tell her anything had happened. And so she felt like, I, I mean, she was still in hysterics with me. And she said, um, you know, I called Andrea and she kept saying, you know, what, what's going on? Okay. Um, she then moved on and said, um, you know, as we were talking about feelings and what was happening, um, that uh, Miss Katrina and, and Miss Donna, and Katrina was um, Sophia and Mason's previous teacher, um, were in a room with her. And um, what I remember is that Andrea collapsed in this chair, kind of like a cushiony chair, um, when she was told that Rusty was shot in that room. Okay. So <clears throat> the last part of that, the noise, I don't know where on earth that comes from, but could you just repeat that last thing? Sure. Because his bell went off. I'm sorry, man. Sure. Um, what Donna relayed to me was how Andrea collapsed in a chair when she was told in the room that Rusty was shot. Okay. And she would have been referring, if you understood, back to the events of November the 18th. The day before, yes. Okay. This is one day afterwards, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, did you have much contact with Mrs. Snyderman after that particular day? I had not had any conversations with her that day. Um, we went over to her house, um, and she was inconsolable, so it was more of just dropping off food, um, paying our respects, and leaving. Okay. When you say inconsolable, if you could define that or describe that as best you can. Sure. Um, there was so much chaos going on in the kitchen and in the living area, kind of the dining room area. She was actually in another room um, on a sofa, and... I literally went from the front door, crossed her, and looked, looked at her, and she just kind of looked up. Um, I don't remember who was sitting next to her, but she had two people next to her. And then I just went into the kitchen with everyone else that was helping out. Did you have any actual conversation with Mrs. Snyderman at that time? No. Okay. What day would that have been, if you recall, ma'am? That was exactly right after my, um, uh, my meeting over at Dunwoody Prep. Okay. So that would have been the 19th as well? Yes. Okay. Um, 
you have become a better friend of Mrs. Snyderman since that time? Yes. Not really sure that that is what what has happened since that time is not relevant. So I'm right. not going to ask you that. Right. But during the time that you have known her, have you ever known her to wear a jean jacket? <laughs> Never. Okay. You ever seen her in possession of a jean jacket? No. Okay. How many times would you estimate you have seen her uh, since November of 2010? Multiple times um, until the arrest. Okay. Um, when yeah. you say multiple, can you quantify it? Um, you can. More than once a month, that's for sure. Um, you know, twice a month. I started going over there in the evenings because she really couldn't be by herself, um, just to help her through this whole process. Um, at yeah. some point, did she begin to go out of the house? Yes. Um, some most of the time, at my urging. Um, I I like my <laughs> nights out Jenny, and. Relevance. 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 Yeah, again, I'm just going to follow up with when they went out, would she have ever seen the jean jacket? Uh, I'm going to sustain that objection. Okay. <laughs> Did you ever see the jean jacket or a jean jacket in possession of Andrea Snyderman at any time? No. Thank you, ma'am. Nothing further. Look, Mr. Daniel, your witness. You and Mrs. Snyderman are friends? Yes. And what kind of friends are y'all? Uh, we are very close friends now. Very close friends now. Yes. Okay, what do you mean by very close friends? Um, we had a lot of mutual friends and started kind of being in the same circle before the murder. She and I were more, a little more than acquaintances by the time that happened. Um, but, you know, after the murder and just knowing that it was something that could have happened to any of us, um, just became more of a support. And through that, just became a lot closer. That we have a lot in common, and uh, you know, it's just it's been a, a long ride since then. So you're very close friends. Yes. Um, how often do you all hang out? Uh, well, I haven't hung out with her since the arrest in August uh, August second, but I was with her at the lake house when that happened. Okay, I'm not asking you about that. Okay. I asked you a specific question. Sure. Okay, just very close. Mm -hmm. How often do you guys hang out? Um, before the arrest, once or twice a month. Okay. I'm not asking you about an arrest. Okay. If you can just answer my questions, okay? Okay. All right. Um, once or twice a month, and what type of things would y'all do when you're hanging out? Um, most of the time, she really didn't want to leave the house, so we would go over to her house. Uh, I do remember a time where we had a reunion um, at the Mellow Mushroom at Dunwoody Prep with the old teachers. Uh, and that was a very um, difficult time for her to kind of go out in public, but all the kids were there and the teachers. Um, there were times that uh, I would get her out for an hour or two just, you know, just to sit and have a drink and talk. So you're her support system, right? I was. Okay. And I presume then y'all talked about what was going on in her life and that yes or no. Did you or did you not talk about what was going on in her life? Yes. All right. And did you talk about this case? Yes. A lot? What was going on consumed her, yes. So did you talk about this case? Um, can I clarify this case and the Hemi Newman case? I'm asking you about this case. Did you talk about this case? Not as much. Okay. Now? You spoke with Ms. Snyderman, right? About this case, right? Mm-hmm. Yes? When she was under investigation, we talked about it. I'm, I'm sorry, maybe you couldn't. <laughs> I, need you, I need you to answer yes. Okay. Okay, you spoke with Ms. Snyderman about this case, yes? No, if I can explain that answer. Yes, ma'am, you can only explain the answer. It wasn't a case when I spoke to her about her being under, under investigation. You spoke with Ms. Snyderman about this investigation, right? Yes. You all talked about it, right? Yes. All right. You've also spoken with Ms. Snyderman's lawyers, right? Yes. About this case, right? Minimally, yes. Okay. About your testimony today, right? Yes. Okay. And when Ms. Snyderman, you, you've referenced her being charged, right? The difference between the investigation and the charge, right? Mm-hmm. Then yes? Yes. And when Ms. Snyderman was charged, you didn't think it was important to 
say, hey, somebody to come to the police, to the DA's office, the DA's investigator, and say, hey, I heard somebody say that your husband's been shot at the daycare. I mean, you knew that that was an issue, right? I had no information about the actual murder of Rusty. Not what I asked you, ma'am. Can you clarify your question then? I'll repeat my question. Sure. My question was, mm -hmm. yes, when she was charged, not investigated, mm -hmm. is that yes? Yes. All right. And you found out that she had charges against her. You yes. didn't think it was important to come to the DA's office, to the police or somebody, all right, mm -hmm. and tell them what you've told the defense, you heard. You didn't think that was important? Um, I didn't think I had a role in that. Well, hold on. <laughs> You've just testified to this jury that Miss mm -hmm. Snyderman is your friend. Yes. Right? And that you have been Miss Snyderman's support system, right? Yes. And that you and Miss Snyderman, and I'm using your words, are that's, that's fine. close, right? Sure, yes. And you didn't think it was important to tell anybody before today that was linked to the state, the police, the DA's office, an investigator, anybody, that you heard somebody say that they heard Ms. Schneiderman, Mr. Schneiderman was shot? I felt it was the state's or the police responsibility to come to me considering I testified at our bond hearing. You, you, you felt like it was the state's responsibility to come to you? If you had questions. So it wasn't important enough to offer this information if, if I mean, if it was going to help your friend? That was the decision I made, yes. So is that yes, it wasn't important? Yes, I made the decision not to go to the police of the state. That wasn't my question. Yes, it wasn't important. It was not important. But she's your friend. Yes, she is. And so, this happened in 2010, right? Correct. So, 2010 passed, you didn't say nothing, right? Mm hmm Yes? Correct. 2011 passed, you didn't say anything, right? Correct. 2012 passed, and, and as you stated earlier, you informed the jury she was arrested, right? Yes. And you still didn't say anything, right? Correct. So now you're showing up for the first time out of the clear blue sky saying that this is what you've heard. It's what I know. Okay. Nothing further. Any yes, Your Honor. Ms. Hansberry, was Andrea Snyderman arrested in the year 2010? No. Was she arrested in the year 2011? No. When was she arrested? She was arrested August 2nd, 2012. After that date, Mr. James has asked you about whether you came to either the DA's office or the police. Did you trust the police? No. Did you trust the DA? Absolutely not. Thank you, ma'am. Any recalls? Sure, Your Honor. So, you just told this jury that there was an investigation before 2012, right? That you knew about? Yes. And you knew about that because you were talking to Andrew Snyderman, right? Yes. Right. And you didn't say anything to the DA's office about it during the investigation, right? No, I did not. And you just told this jury that after the arrest, you still had the same knowledge, right? I did. And you didn't tell the DA's office anything about it then, right? No. But you told the defense, right? Yes. Okay. One more question, Your Honor. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I apologize. Mm -hmm. Have you done an interview with the National News Network? Yes. And what, what was that National News Network? Uh, it was the Crime Siders of CBS, and there were 10 of us that did a group interview. And you did it in, in what was it, Friends in Support of Andrew Snyderman or yes. something like that? Yes. And you're a member of that group, right? Yes, I am. And, and, and how many of y'all is it? Uh, for that interview, there were 10 of us. And y'all, when I say y'all, I apologize. Mm -hmm. No, group, I understand. Right? Y'all do social media as well, right? Some people do, yes. The group does that, right? Yes. And the group posts things in defense of Andrea Snyderman, right? Yes. So it's fair to say you're an Andrea Snyderman advocate, right? Very much so. Nothing further. 
I have no other questions of this witness, Your Honor. May right. you be excused? Lawyer, is there any objection to Ms. Um, Sansbury being released and excused from her subpoena? No, Your Honor. Any objection? All right, you're free to go. Call your next witness. Yes. Let me, let me get to Hold on, let me confirm. Oh, sure you can. Sure you can. All right, go ahead, next witness. Uh, Mr. Jack Gay. All right. You come on up, sir. Just follow the instructions of Deputy Garrett. You sign the swear affirmative. That's what we have to give this court. It should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. If you don't believe in it, you may be seen. Please state the spell your name for the record. Jack Gay, J A C K G A Y. Mr. Gay, directing your attention back to November 18th of 2010, or November of 2010, where were you living, sir? 4865 Manjay Court, Dunwoody. Okay, if you could come a little closer to, so we can all hear you, okay? 4865 Manjay Court, Dunwoody, Georgia. Okay. Were you in close proximity to the home of Russell and Andrea Snyderman at that time? Yes. Okay. Directing your attention specifically to the morning of the day, at some point did you find out or were you made aware of the fact that Rusty Snyderman had been shot? Yes. Okay. On that day, had you observed anything in the morning uh, hours that you subsequently related to the police? Yes. Okay. Uh, first off, what time was it then you made this observation? Between 8.30 a.m. and 9 a.m. Okay. And how is it that you came about to make this observation, sir? Uh, I was taking the trash out and I had a 9 a.m. business appointment at the Perimeter Mall area. How far would your house have been from the Perimeter Mall area at that time? Five minutes. Okay. Uh, what is it that you saw? I saw a gentleman driving a silver van. I want to object at this point, Your Honor, as to relevance. Lawyers approach. <clears throat> Jeff Hutland, you're back with attorney Jay Strongwater as the attorneys have approached the bench. We're getting ready to hear from a neighbor of Andrea and Rusty Snyderman. Um, here is an email from Paige Guns, and, and Paige represents a bunch of emails that I've gotten here in the last few minutes. Hey, I really appreciate your commentary throughout all this coverage. However, I, I don't agree with your take on the testimony of Ms. Parker, Jeff, um, the attorney. I did not see her as being comfortable and confident on the stand. Rather, I found her to to be inappropriate, smiling and laughing in the light of the serious nature of this trial. I was really put off by her. Any thoughts? Sincerely, this is from Paige Guns. And, and give me your take on this, Jay. How did you interpret her? I think this is the, the division between being in the courtroom and seeing all the parties versus a TV camera that's locked in on one particular person and maybe at an inappropriate time. Um, we don't know what was going on. We don't know whether, which of the 12 jurors were paying attention to Ms. Parker versus watching the attorneys, looking at Ms. Snyderman to see how she was reacting to having a friend on the stand. Um, 
there's just a lot of of the courtroom dynamic that we're not privy to yeah. and that could give a totally different impression to the ones that are going to decide whether she was a credible witness. Yeah, here's another one about Tammy Parker. This is from Joy Bailey. It says, Tammy Parker's behavior on the stand, it was a bit over with the smiling and laughing. How professional is it for her, even if she is not a criminal attorney, to turn to the jury, shrug her shoulders, laugh when the defense objected to a question placed to her by the state? And that is a small sampling of the emails and uh, uh, notes that I have received on Twitter that that really have lit up after she left the stand she made a lot of people seriously uh, angry at least with uh, some of the correspondence that i've received today i think at this point in the trial we're left with two very strong witnesses as far as generating emotion or visceral reaction to how they are you have miss citron who i don't know what your tweet count was on her when very, she finished very full that day as well right and then you yeah. have someone who is testifying in direct contradiction to her opinion, mm -hmm. which is generating an equal amount of tweets and emails. So it will be interesting to see how the, the state and the defense address their testimony and in a postscript to the trial to talk to the 12 jurors to say, how did you read this? Did you realize people on the street had one type of reaction? and?" Oftentimes, you'll get a juror saying, I had no idea what you're talking about. What we saw was 180 degrees opposite of your impression. All right, we are closing in on 5 o'clock, and it has that sort of feel that it's going to go to about 5.30 today, doesn't it? I think so. I think this judge wants to move the case. Here's if another. he's got, I'm sorry, if he has witnesses out in the hallway, he's going to put them up. Remember, right. the jury didn't come in until 11 o'clock. Here's another email. Quickly, you guys are doing a great job. I love having Chase yeah, Strongwater here today. I'm sorry about the insects that you guys are fighting on camera. <laughs> it's nice that I can tweet to myself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back to the judge. Oh, you can, and you will. Any questions from the state? No, sir. All right. Lawyers, may this witness be released and excuse me, subpoena. No objection from the state, Your Honor. Yes, sir. All right. You're free to go, sir. Thank you for coming. Have a good day. Call your next witness. Uh, we would call Stephanie Lockridge, Your Honor. All right. Come on up, young lady. Follow the instructions of Deputy Garrett. You saw the swear from the testimony of the staff at this court. It should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing to do second time. They know your name. You may be seated. Please state and spell your name for the Stephanie Lockridge, S T E P H A N I E. L-O-C-K-R-I-D-G-E. Lockridge, do you know the defendant in this case, Mrs. Andrea Snyderman? Yes, sir. Do you see her here in this courtroom today? Yes, sir. Could you point her out for the benefit of the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, please, ma'am, and for the record? Yeah. What is she wearing? A green sweater. Your Honor, again, may the record reflect that the witness has identified the defendant, Andrea Snyderman. The record may still reflect. Did you know her back in 2010? Yes. How is it that you knew Andrea Snyderman in 2010? She and Rusty had a home right beside my mother's house at Lake Oconee. And how long had you known her at that time? Possibly about nine years. Um, who were you working for at that time? The Georgia Bureau of Investigation. How long had you worked for the Georgia Bureau of Investigation? Um, at that point, um, 13 years. Yes. What was, in what capacity did you work for the Georgia Bureau of Investigation? I was a, an analyst, a criminal intelligence analyst. Okay. At some point in the month of December of 2010, after the death of Rusty Snyderman, did you receive a communication or phone call from Mrs. Snyder? Yes. Could you tell us about that, please? She called and um, stated or asked me if there was 
if GBI was working the case. And I was like, no, um, we're not working it. And she was just saying that Dunwoody wouldn't do in their job. She wanted to see if she heard that GBI was working it. And I said, no, we are not working it. Did she ask whether or not the GBI could get involved in the investigation of the case? Yes, and I said that they that we are an assisting agency and Dunwoody would have to ask for our assistance. Absent the request of Dunwoody Police Department to investigate the case, would the Georgia Bureau of Investigation get involved? Um, say it again. If, they didn't, if Dunwoody didn't ask, would the GBI get no. involved? Okay. And how long was this particular phone conversation, if you recall, Ms. Lockett? Um, maybe five minutes. Okay. Was it sometime prior to the arrest of Hemi Newman? It was before, yes. Okay. And sometime after the death of her husband? Yes. Good enough. That's all I have. Who's the witness? Mr. James? Yes, sir. <coughs> Ma'am, what's your position at the GBI again? It was a um, criminal intelligence analyst. And tell us what that, what that means, what you did. We, I would assist the agents in the field. I would, be a, I would run database checks, and if they're out in the field and they're looking for somebody, they would call me and say, can you, I've got this name and a date of birth, can you look and see where I can locate them at? So the agents would do investigations and you would verify the information that they gave you. Is that correct? Say it again. The agents would give you information from their investigation and you would verify the information that they gave you, correct? Through um, checks and things of that nature. Yes. Yes, but if they didn't have a lot of information, then I would, I could do some, I could run Department of Labor and criminal history and stuff like that for them. Running searches? Searches, yeah. Database searches. Um, do you depend on, when you did these searches and you work with the agents, did you all depend on the information um, that y'all were given? Did y'all depend on that to be reliable? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm yes, sorry, sir. you have to answer yes, yes or no. Yes, yes sir. you did. Um, and if it wasn't reliable, could that compromise your investigation? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, you have no opinion or no information one way or the other whether or not the information in this particular investigation was, was reliable, correct? Say it again. You don't know one way or the other if the, if, if the information that was involved in this investigation was reliable. What inv I mean? In the investigation in this case. GBI wasn't involved. Because is, so that's no? No. Okay, and that's because <laughs> the GBI was not involved. Right. Okay, you were just requested to do something. No, I didn't, redu I didn't do anything. Well, you were requested to, listen to my question, you okay. were requested to do something. Andrew Snyderman asked you to see if the GBI could get involved. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Um, she asked me if the GBI was involved. And, and other than that, you have no further knowledge of, of anything in this case? No. Okay. All right. Did you have any knowledge of a sketch that had been prepared in the course of this investigation? Yes. Okay. What would that knowledge have been? I just knew that it was the that Marla did the sketch. Okay. When you say Marla, who is Marla? Marla Lawson. She I was. Would you have the foundation of this one because um, it sounds like it's hearsay, um, and if it's not, he needs to lay the she needs to lay the he needs to lay the proper foundation to her that she had firsthand knowledge of I the understand. sketch. I'm going to sustain the objection. You want to rephrase your question? Nah, it's not worth it, Judge. Thank you very much, Mr. All right. Anything else from my mistake? No, sir. Were you acting in your official capacity or as a friend who took a phone call at your home? No, I was at I was at work. Okay, but were you? Did you? Was, did you run? Well, I'll strike that. I know you were at work when you took the call, but were you responding in your official capacity as a representative of the Georgia Bureau of Investigation? Or no, she friend? just called as a friend. As a friend. Yes. I'm saying, you don't take calls from no victims or victims' families. No. You don't initiate investigations. No. Mm -mm. You don't lead investigations? No. You don't assign cases to people? No, sir. But the reason she had your number because she was a friend of yours? Exactly. Yes, sir. Anything else, lawyers? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Uh, lawyers, may um, are you an investigator? May the investigator be released and excuse for a subpoena? No objection from the state, Your Honor. None whatsoever. Right. Right. You're free to go. Have a good day. Drive safe. You. Call your next witness. Uh, I guess we would call uh, Rabbi Hershey Minkowicz, Your uh, Honor. All right.
Square right there. Right here. The Solomon Square on front of the testimony shall give this court. It should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, sir. Please state the spelling name for the record. Hirsch, H I R S C H, Minkowitz, M I N K O W I C Z. Sir, do you know the defendant in this case, Mrs. Andrea Snyderman? Yes. Do you see her in this courtroom here today? Yes. Could you point out for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury and the record uh, where she is and describe what she is wearing? She's sitting on the table on the left and she's wearing a green sweater. Okay. Again, Your Honor, may the record reflect that the witness has identified the defendant, Mrs. Andrea Snyder. Yes, sir. The record may so reflect. Um, how is it that, when is it that you actually met Andrea Snyderman? On November 19th, the day after Rusty was killed. When you say November 19th, would that have been of the year 2010? Yes. Okay. What were the circumstances under which you met or had occasion to meet Mrs. Snyderman? Uh, her sister-in-law, her brother's wife, had called me and asked, she knew me from before, and she called me and asked me if I can come to the house. Originally, she was asking if I can come to the house to help speak to her children. Okay. Let me ask you this, sir. Did you know um, Mrs. Snyderman's sister-in-law? Yes. Okay. Did you have communication with Mrs. Snyderman's sister-in-law? Yes. When would that communication have been, sir? <coughs> Uh, it was first through email. No, late just, just tell us the date. Oh, um, late night on November 18th, 2010, and then the following morning, November 19th, 2010. Did you have occasion then to go to Mrs. Snyderman's home on November the 19th of 2010? Yes. Okay. Was that the first time you had met her? Yes. Okay. Um, did you have occasion to develop a friendship with her at that time? Yes. Can you describe for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury the condition that you saw Andrea Snyderman in on November the 19th of 2010, sir? Okay. When I came to the house for the first time, when I walked in, um, there was like a little area first, and then you walked into a big area, and off to one side on the right was the kitchen, and she was sitting right at the kitchen table there with her mother and on the left was a room where we were going to go talk and I can just remember that her mother literally had to uh, not carry her but had to literally escort her because she couldn't even walk across the living room into that room on the side where we were going to talk. How far is it from one room where you first saw her to the room where you were going to talk? Probably the width of the jury box I guess a little, a little less. Do you recall how long it actually physically took her to walk that distance, sir? No. Okay. Um, did you have occasion, and again, um, were you present when she spoke with the police on the evening of November the 19th? No. Oh, okay. Now, did you have occasion to meet with her at some other time? Many, many times. In which time frame? Okay. Were you attempting to assist her in helping apprehend the killer of her husband. Oh yes, after that meeting on the 19th, I, from, the, from that time until January 4th when uh, the killer was arrested, I had become very, very close with the family, conversations and meetings, and a lot of it was focused on what we could do to keep this story alive in the media, to get the sketch out, to anything that we could be doing, increasing the reward, or all sorts of things like that to help uh, get the guy caught. Let's go through that point by point, sir. Okay. You made reference to a sketch. What sketch are you referring to? The police l released a sketch, I think it was on Friday afternoon, on the 19th of the... I'm going to object at this juncture. It's improper foundation. Um, if this witness has, if the, if the sketch was released to him, if you saw the sketch, then... But, uh, I'll sustain, Mr. Clegg. You may uh, continue with a different question. So let me show you what has been marked for purposes of identification and previously admitted into evidence as Defendant's Exhibit Number 21. Do you recognize what that is, sir? Yes. What is that, sir? This is the sketch of the killer that was disseminated in the media. Have you seen that sketch previously? Yes. 
was anything done involving you and Mrs. Snyderman to disseminate, specifically how did you make an attempt to disseminate that to the media? Oh, uh, the first thing was on Saturday night, so this is the next day, on November 20th, after late at night, maybe 9, 10 o'clock at night, I came to the house, and at one of the discussions we were having then that there was a, f because there was some... to object to hearsay, uh, that's my first objection. My second objection is relevance as to what he did. Your Honor, I believe that he is doing it with the uh, direct involvement of Mrs. Snyderman. I'm going to object. He's testifying. I'm sorry. Uh, well, well, he's I'm going to lawyers, but I'm, I'm going to hold the objection. I'm going to allow the witness to respond. You go ahead, sir. Okay. Andrea asked me to print out a copy of the sketch and take it along with me to the funeral so that in case media showed up at the funeral, because the media was already amassing and hovering over the story, in case the media showed up to the funeral, what we would do is take out the sketch and wave it to the cameras and stuff just to try to make sure that the sketch was being out there and people were seeing it and hopefully somebody would recognize someone. Was that your intention at the funeral, which was held when? The funeral was held on Sunday, uh, the next day, and uh, that was my intention. Yes, I print, printed it out and I brought it along. Okay. Was that done with the knowledge and understanding of Mrs. Snyderman? Yes, yeah, she asked me to do that, and then I emailed her to tell that I print out the, printed out the sketch and that I have it, and that I'm coming to the funeral with it in my pocket. Okay. Um, did you show it to anyone who was actually at the funeral other than potential media members, if you recall, sir? I don't recall, but luckily the media didn't show up to the funeral, so I didn't have to use it then. Had there been a media presence outside the defendant's home uh, prior to the funeral, if you know? I was not at the house on Sunday morning, I don't know. Okay, not on necessarily just Sunday, but at any point when you went over to the house? Oh yeah, I mean, the second day after I got there, there was already a letter from... The relevance of media presence outside the home, Your Honor? That would explain why it is that he took the sketch with him and attempted to right. disseminate Come it to the media. Overruled, go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Two days after, the few, after Rusty was killed, before he was even buried, there was already a letter posted on the front, pasted onto the front door of Andrea's house from the Today Show, asking that they want to interview people and stuff like that, and that kind of thing was going on already in the beginning, so we knew, we assumed that uh, they're going to come to the funeral. Okay. Was there any attempt made to keep the case alive in the media to attempt to apprehend the killer? Yes, multiple attempts. We met okay, Hold on just for a second before we get into that. Was that done with the knowledge and understanding and at the request of Andrea Snyderman? Yes. Go ahead, sir. Describe the multiple attempts. Okay. Um, like about a week after, after Rusty was killed, a week and a half after, the story was already starting to die down in the news and Andrea was getting very concerned about that, that if it's not going to be kept alive, who's going to see the sketch, who's going to call in a tip or something. So we went to have a meeting with the police to try to talk with them about what we can do, maybe increase the reward or do something because the news, I guess, needed to have a new hook or a new something, a new piece of news to keep it back alive again. Hold so, up for okay. a second, sir. When you say we went to meet with the police, Specifically, who is we? Okay, uh, Andrea, myself, I, if I remember correctly, her father and her brother were there too, but for sure she was there and I was there. Do you recall the approximate date when this meeting, or did you in fact, were you successful in meeting with someone from the Dunwoody Police Department? Yeah, we met with the assistant to the chief, or the deputy chief, his name is Sides, David Sides. We met with him, it was on November 29th. Okay, and did you express what you have just uh, it related to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Yeah, so we spoke to him and asked him what it is that we could do to keep the story alive. And in fact, he was saying that he doesn't really know what else we could do and he doesn't even think increasing the reward would make it. But then at the end of the meeting, he suggested to... Your Honor, as to anything Chief Side says, unless counsel is going to lay the foundation for a prior inconsistent or prior consistent statement. I'm at a loss to understand that one, Your Honor. I'll just move that. Oh, okay. Without I'm getting into specific, sure laws, I'm going to sustain the objection. Okay. Without getting specifically into um, what Mr. Side said, did you get the name of a potential media contact? Objection, Your Honor. That's again hearsay. Did you get the name? That name would have been offered by someone by an out-of-court declarant, and I presume for the truth of the matter asserted that he in fact got it, which would be classic hearsay. All right. Let's play response. No, Your Honor, I do not. All right. Next question. 
Uh, did you contact someone with the media after that meeting? Yes, uh, I contacted two people. Uh, Mark Winnie, he's a reporter for Channel 2, and Christian Boone, he's from the AJC. Who would have actually contacted these two individuals, sir? I did. Okay. And did you do so with the... Was Mrs. Snyderman aware of the fact that you were contacting these individuals? Yes, I was updating her every step of the way. Everything I was doing, I was discussing with her. Did you have her approval when you contacted these individuals? Yeah, I mean, she was gung-ho. Do everything we can to try to get it back up into the media, so absolutely. What was your purpose in contacting these two individuals, sir? Um, uh, the deputy chief sides had told me that this no, would be a... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Just what was your purpose? The purpose was to try to get the story back in the news again so that it could be on the top of the headlines. The ultimate purpose is that the sketch would be out there so that people would see it and hopefully somebody would call in a tip. Okay. And do you recall whether any additional media coverage was generated by virtue of your attempts to communicate or your actual communications with these individuals? Yeah, they actually did a piece. Uh, WSB did a piece on December 2nd okay. as a result of that. Was Mrs. Snyderman aware of the fact that WSB was going to do that piece? Yes, she was. And did she give her approval that they do so? She gave the approval that I could work with them on the story. I mean, WSB decided if they're doing the story or not, but she gave the approval that I could work with them on the story. To your knowledge, was that sketch that we have previously made reference to, I believe it is Defense Exhibit Number 21, was that featured in any subsequent news story from WSB? Yeah, it was featured, to the best of my recollection, it was featured in that piece on December 2nd. Okay. You made reference to a reward. Can you tell us about that, sir? Yeah, so one of the things that we had discussed, Andrea and I and some of the other family members, uh, multiple times was that one of the ways that we would might entice someone to call in a tip would be if we increase the reward and this would also help the media have a new story to run with that the family increased it and increased it so that's one of the things that was an ongoing conversation and we did that once for sure maybe even twice did you have additional contact with the dunwoody police department after november the 29th sir the next time I had a contact with the Dunwoody, well, I, there were some phone conversations ongoing with Detective Thompson and other things, you know, when we were talking about the reward and stuff. Hearsay, Sorry. Hearsay, conversations with Detective Thompson that he had. He says he was talking about what he was talking about. All right. For the purpose of this, I'm going to the objection. Go ahead and ask. Okay, don't go. I mean, did, I, I'm not asking you to get into specifics, sir. Did you have contact with representatives of the Dunwoody Police Department after the meeting of November the 29th of 2010? Yes, I did. Can you estimate the number of times you would have had communication with representatives of the Dunwoody Police Department after that date, sir? Phone calls, I can't put an exact number on it, probably 10, 15 maybe. But then we had a meeting. Okay, but again, I just want you to hold up a second before we get to the meeting, okay? Um, to your, do you remember whether those phone calls were made with the uh, understanding of and approval of Andrea Snyderman? Yeah, yes. Like she would say, so let's do the re reward. Let's go from 10000 to 20000 Call Andy, referring to Thompson, and that kind of thing. So we'd have a conversation, and then I'd call him to talk about some ideas that we had. Okay, and again, I know... Lawyers, excuse me one second. Lawyers, approach for a minute. Jeff Fellins, you're back with uh, Jay Strongwater. Jay, I can't tell you how many, how many questions we're getting off Twitter and off email right now. So many, believe it or not, we, you and I have been talking a lot since 9 a.m. this morning. Um, we'll get to those when we can, but right now let's focus on the rabbi here who's, who's focus in the aftermath of the death of Rusty Snyderman seemingly would be the media and um, media reports and, and, and the investigation as opposed to her spiritual health. Am, am I wrong on this? Am, what am I missing here on That's this? That's the direction of the question and, questions and testimony. Hopefully, there was some counseling and bereavement counseling and talking to the kids or the family, and that simply just doesn't play into what needs to be brought out or what the defense feels needs to be brought out at this point. The state has been very aggressive in objecting and limiting testimony, and it may be that the defense feels that by going into what other purpose did you serve, 
would just elicit more objections. So what, what is the point of this testimony? Is it to show that Andrea Snyderman aggressively was seeking a suspect in her husband's murder? Yes, that he wanted to, she wanted to keep the story alive. She was made available through the rabbi. Um, help, was, help me understand this. I, I, this rabbi comes onto the scene. She doesn't know Andrea Snyderman or Rusty Snyderman. He shows up the day after the murder, and all of a sudden he's directing media coverage and Dunwoody police. Is that unusual in Jewish culture, or would he play that kind of role? Help me, as a Catholic guy, help me understand that. Uh, the whole case is unusual. Uh, somehow he was able to draw their attention and affection and trust. And being a cleric, uh, they followed his advice before right. they retained counsel uh, to get legal advice. So he will play the role wearing many hats, so to speak. Yes. Okay. All right, back into the courtroom now. On the floor, because I don't want you to interact with anyone you should not interact with or anything you should not hear. Uh, do not read or look at any media coverage pertaining to this case. Do not go upon the internet and do any research about this case. Do not blog about this case while it's ongoing. Do not attempt to go to any location that may have been made reference to. All the evidence will come to you in the form of sworn testimony and anything that's introduced during the course of the trial. You're more than welcome to bring something to snack you know, or eat with you during the uh, afternoon and morning sessions. Do not um, consume any alcoholic beverages during lunch. Deputy Garrett's going to turn back over to your cell phones, iPhones, and iPads, and you can check your messages, but do not uh, text, email, or do anything like that pertaining to this case while it's ongoing. As I mentioned to you earlier, lawyers and parties cannot talk or interact with you, um, and I don't ever want you to think they're being rude or discourteous. And you're right, it is getting warmer in here, and I, I'm not the only one who's feeling it. I will do the best I can to talk to um, building maintenance and see why is it late in the afternoon is just getting warmer, but I will try to have the temperature, uh, for back, lack of a better term, more comfortable because it is getting a little warm in here late in the afternoons. I've noticed that also. We're going to reconvene tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock a.m. and follow a um, similar schedule. Um, you can leave your um, notepads and those things in the jury room to turn them face down. Um, you can just follow the instructions of Deputy Garrett, um, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi